As we continue to work with integration, we're going to answer the question today, how do we integrate the chain rule? Remember, the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us that integration and derivatives are inverses of each other. So if we take a derivative with the chain rule, how do we integrate and use that chain rule in reverse? The answer to that question is a process we call substitution. And here's the idea behind this substitution idea. If we let the integral of lowercase f of x dx equal capital F of x plus a constant, in other words, capital F is the antiderivative of lowercase f of x, then we know a couple things are true. If I wanted to take the derivative of capital F of x, that would be lowercase f of x by the fundamental theorem of calculus. But if we take it one step further and ask to take the derivative of capital F of another function, let's say of g of x, we could use the chain rule to take this derivative. The chain rule says we take the derivative of the outside. The derivative of capital F is lowercase f of g of x. But then the chain rule says we multiply by the derivative of the inside, so whatever g prime of x is. Well, then let's continue with this fundamental theorem of calculus. If I integrate that solution, if I integrate lowercase f of g of x times g prime of x dx, that has to equal, then, the stuff we had before. That has to equal the capital F of g of x plus some constant. But what's interesting here is, what if we take another approach? What if in this original integral, we let u equal that g of x function? And if I scroll down to buy myself some space, if I let du equal the derivative of g of x times dx, the integral then changes. Notice what pieces I have here. The g of x becomes u. du becomes g prime of x dx. So now I have the integral of f of u times all the rest of that stuff becomes du. Notice the du and the u, a substitution has been made. And we know what the integral of f of anything is. It's capital F. So what we end up with is capital F of the u plus a constant. But remember that u is equal to the g of x. So really, we're saying capital F of g of x plus a constant, which is exactly the same thing that we got by breaking apart the pieces. This middle step where I let u and du equal the pieces of the function, that is what we call the substitution step. If we can simplify a function by identifying the inside function, identifying that g of x function, the entire integral becomes much, much simpler. That's what we're going to try and do. So to summarize that process, define the inside, whatever that is, as u such 
that the derivative of u is part of the function. Here's what I mean by that. Let's say if I had the integral of 5x to the fourth times x to the fifth plus 3 cubed dx. Notice if I look at this inside function, its derivative is 5x to the fourth, which is part of the function. Let me use blue, which is part of the function with the dx. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to define u to be that inside stuff, x to the fifth plus 3. That is my u. du, then, is its derivative, 5x to the fourth. And then we always multiply by a dx. Notice that is the remaining part of the function. So now what's left in the, is the integral. All the blue stuff, 5x to the fourth dx, is going to become du. The yellow stuff just becomes u, and we still have that third power on it. And what we've done is we've simplified the complex integral to a much simpler integral of u to the third. We know the integral of u to the third is u to the fourth divided by 4 plus a constant. And what's nice here is we have this u that we know is equal to x to the fifth plus 3. So we substitute back x to the fifth plus 3 to the fourth power divided by 4 plus a constant becomes our antiderivative, or our integral. This process of substitution is what we're looking at today, seeing if we can identify this u that's part of the function such that its derivative du is also part of the function to hopefully give us a simpler integral that's really easy to calculate. And then we just substitute back to x's at the end. Let's take a look at a few examples and see if we can get good at this process and also see some of the intricacies that might come up out of this. So b, examples. First example we're going to do is we're going to find the integral of x divided by the square root of x squared plus 3 dx. We don't really have any antiderivative that that looks familiar from. So we might try our u substitution, looking for u to be the inside stuff so that its derivative is kind of everything else around it. Notice inside the radical, we've got x, plus, x squared plus 3. That x squared plus 3 then can become our u. du then is the derivative of u. du is 2x times a dx. Now, this is interesting because we want 2x times dx to be the du part. We only have 1x times the dx. We're going to make a little adjustment to our problem. We may need to multiply by a constant inside, and it's reciprocal outside the integral. This is our first little nuance. What I mean by that is we're missing the number 2. 
Since that is a constant, just the number 2, I can multiply by a 2 inside the integral as long as I multiply by its reciprocal outside the integral. Because you see what's possible is the 2's would divide out, and it still has the same value. We're not going to divide out the, the 2's, however, because now 2x is what's needed, 2x dx is what's needed to make that du, we're ready to make our substitution. We still have the 1 half outside times the integral. The 2x dx is just going to become a du. And we have left over 1 over the square root of all the stuff that becomes u. Now, we like square roots to become 1 half powers. And denominators really become negative exponents. So what we're really saying is u to the negative 1 half power. And this is an integral that's much easier to take. Keeping the 1 half out front times negative 1 half increasing by 1 becomes a positive 1 half multiplying by the reciprocal of 2. And then we add a constant. Now, this is nice because the 2's are going to divide out. So what we really have is u to the 1 half plus a constant. But then let's go back and change that u back into the x. So u is equal to x squared plus 3, all that to the 1 half power, plus a constant. We have our solution. Let's try one with some trigonometry in it. Let's take the integral of sine theta cosine to the fourth theta d theta. And this doesn't look like any antiderivative that we've seen before. So we might think substitution is a good solution to make this into something easier to work with. Do we make the u equal to the sine, the cosine, the fourth power, or some combination thereof? Remember, we want the u to be the inside function. The only thing I see inside is there's a cosine inside of a fourth power. So let's make u equal to the cosine of theta. And then du would be its derivative, which is negative sine theta d theta. But we have a problem again, because this is negative sine theta d theta. We have a positive sine theta d theta. So what we can do, though, is multiply by a negative 1 inside the radical and a negative 1 outside the radical so that we have that negative inside that we need to complete that du. Now we have a negative integral. The negative sine theta d theta becomes a du. The cosine becomes a u, and now we just have a fourth power. And this integral now is very easy to evaluate. It's u to the fifth divided by 5. Don't forget the negative out front, plus c. And of course, we're going to substitute that u back into a cosine fifth power. So negative fifth cosine of theta divided by 5 plus a constant. We have r integral. Let's do one more that has a very interesting nuance to it. Let's do the integral of x divided by the square root of x minus 1 dx. Hopefully, we're getting good at identifying u as the inside function. What I see inside is an x minus 1. That means du, its derivative, is just 1 dx. So x minus 1 is u. And dx is our du. But we've got a problem in that there is an x left over. 
We don't like having an x left over. We need to go all the way to use or not at all. We can't just go halfway. So there's another nice little trick that we can use is if we have an x left over, we can solve the u equation for x to substitute. What I mean by that is this, if u equals x minus 1, adding 1 to both sides, x is equal to u plus 1. And so we can make another substitution to replace the x with u plus 1. And let's see what type of integral that gives us. So the x becomes u plus 1 over the square root, which is a 1 half power. The x minus 1 becomes a u, and the dx becoming du. We can do a quick division, divide both sides by u to the 1 half, and that gives us the integral of u to the positive 1 half plus u to the negative 1 half du. And we have an integral that we can solve. Raise the exponent by 1, we get u to the 3 halves times the reciprocal of 2 thirds. Plus, raise the reciprocal by 1, we get u to the 1 half times the reciprocal of 2 plus a constant. And now all we have to do is replace those u's with what they equal. 2 times x minus 1 to the 3 halves divided by 3 plus 2 times x minus 1 to the 1 half plus a constant. And we have our integral. So far, we've been working with these indefinite integrals that don't have limits of integration. If there's limits of integrations, this process actually becomes easier. So let's take a look at definite integrals. The nice part about definite integrals is when we do the substitution step, we can replace the limits with whatever u equals. I'll say the u equals solution. So for example, we have the integral from 0 to 1 of x squared plus 1 e to the x cubed plus 3x dx. And to do our u substitution, we look for an inside function. And you might see an inside function, x cubed plus 3x, is inside e to the x. So that's going to be our u, x cubed plus 3x. That's our u. du, then, is its derivative, 3x squared plus 3dx. But do we see 3x squared plus 3 in our integral? Well, kind of. If we were to factor a 3 out, it would be x squared plus 1 dx. And now you see we have x squared plus 1 dx, x squared plus 1, and a dx multiplied together. We just need to account for that 3 by multiplying 3 inside and 1 third outside. So now we've got the 3 that we need for both parts. Now we have 1 third times the integral from 0. Here's where it becomes nice. We're going to take that 0 and plug it in for our x. Plugging 0 in, we'd have 0 cubed plus 3 times 0 equals u, or u equals 0. So our lower limit is going to be 0. 
For the upper limit, we plug the upper limit of 1 into the u equals equation. 1 cubed plus 3 times 1 equals u, or u equals 4. So my upper limit is 4. All right, new limits. Going back to my function, the 3x squared plus 1 dx all became a du. We're just left with e to the u, which is the easiest integral to take. We have 1 third e to the u. But we don't have to substitute back, because now we have limits for u going from 0 to 4. Plugging 4 in, we get uh, 1 third. Let's put the e to the u in the numerator. e to the fourth over 3 minus e to the 0, which is 1 over 3, or e to the fourth minus 1 over 3 is the area under this curve between 1 and 0. So with definite integrals, it's nice because we can do this extra step to plug the limits in for u to get our new limits. And we don't have to go back to x's. We now just can work with the u's. Let's do one more that I think is just a fun problem that we can now do. We're going to take the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of sine squared theta d theta. This one, you might be tempted maybe to make u equal to the inside function of sine theta. The problem is, is du, its derivative is cosine theta. And there is no cosine theta in this integral. We can't make one either. But we do have another nice trick. You remember your double angle formula from trig? The double angle formula says that sine squared is equal to 1 minus the cosine of 2 theta all over 2. So let's integrate that from 0 to pi over 2 d theta. I'm going to divide this 2 into both sides. And while I'm at it, I'm going to split into two integrals on that negative sign. So when I do that, I have the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of just 1 half d theta minus the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of 1 half cosine of 2 theta d theta. Now, on the left side, this is really nice. The left side is an easy derivative, or an easy antiderivative. It's 1 half theta. And then we just have to integrate that from 0 to pi over 2. The right side, though, takes a little bit more work because we need to use u substitution to actually solve it. We're going to make u equal to the inside stuff, which you can see is 2 theta. And du is equal to its derivative, which is 2 d theta. So we've got 2, u, two theta for our u. Our du is 2 d theta. We've already got the d theta, but I've got 1 half instead of 2. So if I multiply by 4. 4 halves will equal 2, and we'll do a 1 fourth on the outside. So now my integral becomes the integral from, let's plug 0 into theta. 2 times 0 is 0. Plug pi over 2 into the u equation. 2 times pi over 2 is pi. And then the 2 d theta became our du. And we're just left with the cosine of u, du, which means we are subtracting, bringing down that subtraction, 
we are subtracting. The antiderivative of cosine is sine of u. And the u's we're going to integrate from 0 to pi. So plugging pi over 2 in, we get 1 half of pi over 2. Minus 1 half of 0 is 0. Minus, plugging pi in, sine of 0 is 0. And then we subtract a negative, which makes it a positive. Sine of 0 is 0. I'm sorry, sine of pi is 0. Sine of 0 is 0. It's all the same. Simplifying this out, we end up with a single pi over 4 is the area underneath sine squared between 0 and pi over 2. This one was kind of fun because we had to use a trig formula to make it work. What you really want to focus on is the substitution step that we did on that second integral there or on all the other integrals up above. Doing that substitution step of identifying u, the inside function, du, the outside function, to give us an easier integral that we can solve. Take a look at that on the homework assignment. Try a few of those. Come to class with questions. We'll talk about it more and continue to work on these problems.